Shalom Aleichem to every one of you. May I greet you all. Chag, Sukkot Sameach, and Shabbat Shalom at the same time. We are here in this uh, topic of the great Chag, the great feast, the holy appointed feast of Hashem. And it is the 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 feast of uh of uh Scott found in Vayikra that is Leviticus chapter 23 starting from verse 34 to 36 and I will read from the complete Jewish Bible tell the people of Israel on the 15th day of the seventh month is the feast of Scott for the seven days to Adonai. On the first day, there is to be a holy convocation. Do not do any kind of ordinary work. For seven days, you are to bring an offering made by fire to Adonai. On the eighth day, you are to have a holy convocation and bring an offering made by fire to Adonai. It is a day of public assembly. Do not do any kind of ordinary work. And reading from Devarim or Deuteronomy, chapter 16, 14, and 15, quoting again from the complete Jewish Bible, Rejoice at your festival, you, your sons and daughters, your male and female, slaves, the Levim and the foreigners, the orphans, the widows living among you. Verse 15, seven days you are to keep the festival for Adonai your God. In the place Adonai your God will choose because Adonai your God will bless you in all your crops and in all your work. So you are to be full of joy. May I say that again? In all your work, so you are to be full of joy. This is the only feast, my dear friends, that God is commanding all in the house of Israel to rejoice and to be full of joy. The question is why? What is so important and special during this holy appointed feasts of Hashem? Remember, there are only holy appointed biblical and scriptural feast of Hashem. Other than this, there are considered man's appointed feasts. Or you can say it as pagan feasts. And if it is pagan, God has nothing to do with it. So the topic that I would like to, to just teach today by the help of God, is entitled the Sukkah of God's Chupa. Chupa means the marriage covenant for us, his bride. After the Yitziat Mitzrayim, that is the exodus from Egypt, B'nai Israel camped in tents or scot or in booth. And this is something they have done for 40 long years. They've gathered together and truly encamped themselves in such a fashion that Hashem tabernacled in their midst. And it is called commonly as the tabernacle of Moshe Rabbeinu in the wilderness. This is such a picture of the the pleasure and the and the the will of God to tabernacle with his people, his covenanted prized eternal possession, which is Israel. We can see in Shemot or Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 and 9, the words of Hashem, God the Father Himself. And I quote, He said, in English, it says, let them make 
me, let them make me, Hashem says, a sanctuary or a tabernacle that I may dwell within them. That I may dwell within them. That's that's the plan. That's that's the desire of our Father God in heaven. And that is to dwell within his people, Israel. As beautifully said in the Brit Hadesha scripture, from the mouth of Rav Shaul, when he wrote to the Messianic Jews, a.k.a. to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 13, it says, acknowledging that they were aliens and temporary residents on the earth, knowing for a fact that all the believers in the house of Israel, even during the time of, of antiquity, during the time of the Bnei Israel in the wilderness with, with God's servant Moshe Rabbeinu, those believing in one true God, reciting Shema Israel Hashem Eloheinu Hashem Echad, these believers, they know for a fact that they are just aliens, therefore temporary residents on this earth. They did not receive this knowledge, this great wisdom from the Holy Torah. They did not. You know unto whom they received this, this ta'at, this deep intimate, intimate knowledge about, about God and His purpose, that the people of Israel are never to be permanent dwellers in the land, wherever they may be, but just aliens and pilgrims and passers-by and temporary residents on this earth, they came to know that through the Avot. They came to know that through our patriarchs, who are Avraham Avinu, Itzkak Avinu, Yaakov Avinu, even our father Avraham, our father in the faith, never reckoned himself to to have riches and, and treasures on this earth. He himself have spoken beautifully among the children of Chet to the heat to the to the, to those people that he is a stranger, a gear, a, a temporary dweller. And in the book of Hebrews, it says that Avraham Avinu was Searching for a place whose maker and builder is God. He will never ever, ever settle for anything less than a place which is permanent, not temporary, and it belongs to Hakadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem, our God. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, I quote, Dear friends, I urge you, Apostle Peter, Kepha, said it in conjunction or, or in a cross-parallel reference to the words of Rab Shaul, Apostle Paul. He said, dear friends, when you say friend, it is somebody whom you are so close and intimate with. A person that you can invite to your home considering he is your trusted fellow, a friend. He says, dear friends. I urge you as aliens and temporary residents not to give in to the desires of your old nature, which keep warring against you. Look at the words of the Shaliach, Apostle Kepha. Says it very beautifully. Tells it to himself. Tells to his fellow apostles. Tell, told his fellow followers and disciples of Messiah Yeshua during their time, during the early Messianic community, as others called early church. It says, I urge you as aliens, they knew for a fact, here and here, they are not permanent dwellers in Israel or in Jerusalem or any place. They call themselves aliens, temporary residents not to give in to the desires of their old nature. And he said, which keep warring against you. 
there is a tug of war happening within. It's called Yitzharhara, the evil inclination of each and every one of us, wanting to satisfy the appetites of our flesh, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pleasures that enter in, the the want to give in to materialism and physicalities every day of this borrowed life. We are warring against these realities, these physicalities, and knowing for a fact that it will give no gain to our soul. As a matter of fact, it's going to pull us down. Why? Because we need nothing of this kind. It's going to be a problem again against our elev spiritual elevation and spiritual maturity. So it is something that we have to remember. That is why here comes the face of Scott. Here comes for us to remember what God did. How did God truly taught his people Israel? After Yitziat Mitzrayim, after the exodus from Egypt, what did God do? God called them to make for themselves temporary dwelling place, a sukkah, a tent, or booth. And around those encampment of Israel, where they have their booth and their tents, in the center is the sukkah the tabernacle of God himself, where the holy place and the holy of holies, his presence dwells. My question to you, my dear friends, is this. How in the world did God choose the desert, an obscure place, a dry place, a place where there is no no all or there's no city side or no glittering lights and no music and no thing whatsoever. It's a dry place. It's a wilderness. Why did God choose that place? For us, never. For us, never. To engage ourselves in this kind of Physicality and materialism. It is where God will reveal himself in a state of nothingness, in a place of obscurity. It is also the place where we are to prove to God that he is our first love. Because so many people can say, oh, we love God. Oh, we follow his commandments because our pockets are full. We have a lot of money in our banks. We, we drive good, fancy cars. We dwell in such beautiful houses. It's easy to say we love God. But how about if God tests us? How, how about if God tries us? He places us in a state of lack. What if? He places us in that place of wilderness kind of life. No electricity, no good furnitures. It's just a booth. It's a sukkah. It's a tent. Are we going to really love God? Are we going to murmur? Are we going to be complainers? Are we going to say, "Hey, what's what's the matter? Why in the world that you? Why did you take me out of Egypt just to let me suffer here in a wilderness?" That's exactly what the B'nai Israel did when they encountered such tests and trials in the presence of God. They murmured, they, they complained, they rebelled against God. And God took no pleasure in such kind of universal, general, humankind, natural tendencies, if I may say. But this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where the test comes. God will never settle for anything less. I've always been rubbing that in, my friends. 
He is a zealous God and he is a jealous God. He always want us to say, God, no matter what, you are Dayenu. No matter what, you are more than enough. Even if you take away all the pleasures that I used to enjoy, if it, you withhold all the blessings, I still love you just the same. You are my first love. God wants to hear those words that comes out of our lips. A free choice, a free will, that nothing can ever suffice, even the blessings of God. You sure the Messiah beautifully said it in the book of Yohan and John chapter 6. He had a lot of multitude of followers believing him because of the miracles, the signs and wonders, feeding of the of thousands by a few loaves of bread and 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 few fishes, fed them, made miracles, raised the dead, healed the sick, produced a lot of miracles and blessings left and right, front and back, up and bottom. But Yeshua knew that. And then Yeshua declared a powerful stumbling block. Yes, Yeshua stumbled the people. He designed it by saying, anyone who will not drink my blood and will not eat my flesh has no part of me. When those thousands of followers of Yeshua heard that, they startled and they murmured, how can we receive such a hard saying? How can he say we have to eat his flesh and drink his blood? Ah, oh, enough is enough. We have nothing to do with this. They left. They split. All the thousands of followers that used to enjoy the blessings and the blessings instead of the blesser himself stopped following him. And then Yeshua the Messiah turned to his 12 followers and said, How about you? Do you have any place to go? They left. How about you? Here came along. Kepha. Peter said, Where can we go? Lord, where can we go? It is only unto you we found the words of life. The beautiful words of the genuine-hearted Peter, Kepha, the apostle, said, Lord, we are not going anywhere. We will follow you because only to you we heard the words of life. This is such a testing, my dear friends that always reverberate in the corridors of time through generations past generations, that God is commanding his people to prove, to prove that truly he is our first love. In the book of Revelation, hit Galut, it says, I, I, I have something against you. Chapter 2, verse 4. You, you are good servers. You you worship me with zealousness. Good. You are ministers. You you share and teach the gospel. Good. But verse 4 says of Revelation 2, but I have somewhat against you. <gasps> you have somewhat against us? Yes, I have somewhat against you. Listen to the words of that zealous, jealous Messiah. You have left your first love. You have left your first love. Maybe you have you are so so busy and so occupied with ministry and service, serving me through this, serving me through that. But how about giving your whole heart to me, even to the point of giving your life over to me? Are you going to be faithful? 
to that point? My dear friends, this is the exact reason why there is a feast of Scott. There is a feast of tabernacles because this feast is being intertwined with deep, deep truth from the heart of God. It comes from the heart of God. In the book of John, chapter 1, verse 14, starting from verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I would like to read it from the Orthodox Jewish Bible. And the Devar Hashem, the Word of God, did with Hashem, became bodily, and made his sukkah, made his sukkah, his mishkan, or you can say, his tabernacle among us, and we gazed upon his shekinah. We gazed upon his presence, the shekinah of Ben Yaqid. Ben Yaqid is the son of the the son of the unique begotten of the Father, from Elohim Ha'av, from God the Father, full of Hashem's chesed, ve'emet. Full of his loving kindness and truth. Don't forget the truth. Because others always say, grace, 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 grace. They forgot the next word. The truth. The Torah is truth. It's, it speaks of the Son of God, the, the Word of God that made his sukkah among us. And he tabernacled himself among us. When did that happen? How did that happen? The Bible says he was born in a wooden crib. A manger in simpler English translation. What is a manger? A wooden crib. What is a wooden crib? It is a feeding trough. A, the place where the, the, the grass for the animals are, are being fed. It is like a wooden thing, like that. And the, the hay, the grass are being placed there, and the animals fed on it. That's the manger, the throw, and it is inside a sukkah. The sukkah is where, listen to this, during the time of the birth of Messiah Yeshua, during this, this, this similar season, October, or end of September, the fall season, not December, by the way, no. It says, it is where the sukkah and the baby infant was laid on a manger, a feeding trough, okay? A wooden feeding trough, and, and he was wrapped in a swaddling clothes. That is a cloth that is being wrapped tightly to a first, firstborn infant, in order for to be warmed, and and not and not uh, feel the coldness or whatever. It is the place, the sukkah, is where the animals dwells and rest at night. In the in the book of Luke, chapter two, verses seven to sixteen. I would like to quote this. And she, that's Miriam or Mary, she gave birth to her, to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in strips of cloth and set him down in a manger. That is the crib. That is the feeding trough for animals to feed on. Since there was no inn for them, for them in the inn, now there were shepherds in the same region living out in the fields and guarding their flock at night. Look at this. There were shepherds. They were guarding their flock at night. It couldn't be December, my friends, because all the, the flock, the animals will die because December is winter time. There, there are snowfall during this time. If it is December, Especially during the late or the the late uh, December, so it couldn't be. It is the feast of Scott, where the flock 
were guarding their, or the, the, the shepherds were guarding their flocks at night, at night in the fields. Suddenly, an angel of Adonai stood before them, and the glory of Adonai shone all, or, all around them. And they were absolutely terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I proclaim good news to you, which will be great joy to all the people. A Savior is born to you today in the city of David, who is Messiah. The Lord. And the sign to you is this you will find an infant wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly a multitude of heavenly armies appeared. Wow, this is mind boggling. It begs description. Suddenly a multitude of heavenly armies appeared. These are angels, myriads of angels, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth shalom to men of good will. And when the angels departed from them into the heavens, the shepherds were saying to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which Adonai has made known to us. Verse 16, and So they hurried off and found Miriam in Yosef, and the baby lying in the manger, manger or the crib or the feeding trough. Look at that. Yeshua the Messiah, the Son of God, Ben Yahid, the one and only unique Son of God chose. He chose to be born in a sukkah, a good for nothing. His king, his God, but he divinely purposed to show us an example. Because we are aliens and temporary residents on this earth. That is what he designed for us first to his and for his son, Yeshua the Messiah. The shepherds return, glorifying, praising God for all the things that they have heard and seen, just as they have been told. Look at that, my friends. Look at the parallelism of the reality and truth that God is showing to us in this day and age, 2024, where, where there is already that, that, that great discovery and, and such such sophisticated knowledge and, and, and all the things that, that has uh, been invented, that knowledge ever increasing, there's already that, that great billionaire Elon Musk, Baruch Hashem, happens to be a supporter of, of Donald Trump. But nothing is difficult anymore. They have designed sophisticated cars and all this, this weaponry and all these things that man can conceive. It's already here. But the word of God never changes. The heart of God for his people are to be aliens and temporary residents, not to love the pleasures and materialism, never to entertain any lust, never because it is detrimental. For our souls, my friends. Yeshua the Messiah in Yohanan 7, John 7. During the Feast of Scott. This is during the Feast of Scott. Chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. Reading from the complete Jewish Bible. Now on the last day of the festival. What is this festival? Scott. Yeshua the Messiah is observing. Pharisaical Judaism. This is scriptural, my friends. Yeshua. Yes, Jesus, the Messiah. Yeshua stood and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come. Let him coming. Let him keep coming to me and drinking. 
the correct translation is, let him keep coming to me and drinking. Look at that. Because during the time, during the, the Hoshana Rabbah, the last day of Sukkot, the Kohen pours a water and pronounce some great deep truth. And the Kohen Gadol, not from the order of Aharon Kohen, but from the order of Malchizedek, Yeshua the Messiah, he stood up during this Hoshana Rabbah. And he said with a loud voice, Yeshua stood and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him keep coming to me and drinking. Whoever puts his trust in me, as the scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from his innermost being. Wow. Verse 39, now he said this about the spirit from whom who trusted those who trusted in him were received later because the Spirit had not been given, because Yeshua had not yet been glorified. End of quote. That is referring to the death, the crucifixion, death, burial, and on the third day, the resurrection of our Messiah, Yeshua. My dear friends, this is something to do with our such, such redemption and salvation for each and every one. That is why we are to know this. We are to celebrate this with knowledge, with understanding, with deep awareness, with thanksgiving. Because the Feast of Sukkot is the Feast of the Mashiach. He was born during Sukkot. He was born during Sukkot, not December. And I believe, and all the rabbis in the house of Israel do believe that this glorious return will also fall on this great Chag, this great feast, Sukkot. The Merry Supper of the Lamb. Do you have an idea of what a Jewish Merry Supper of the Lamb is? There is a there is a sort of called chupa where the bride and the groom stand. You know what? That chupa is being covered with some piece of white linen and it is it is open to the heavenlies. Chupa. It is about the marriage shopper of the lamb in a chupa, like a sukkah. Why? Because the bridegroom king, yes, Messiah Yeshua, will be celebrating his marriage supper celebration with his bride, Israel. It is our day of great celebration because it symbolizes the marriage supper celebration of those who will be inside those multitude of overcomers and faithful believers up to the end who will join the bride of the bridegroom king Yeshua the Messiah still the venue, the place of location, will be in a chupa. What is that chupa? It is like a sukkah. Because the beauty is in the bridegroom king. The beauty is in the spotless, white, pure garments of his bride. Not physicalities, no externals, no material studded gold or silver. But those beauty comes from the faithfulness, 
the overcomers up to the end. So much in love with Messiah Yeshua. That is why this is our time to show Hashem, I will stay in a booth. I will stay to remind myself that I am an alien. I am a temporary resident on this earth and I will never settle anything. But the permanent tabernacle, the permanent tabernacle that you will give, not just to me, but to all the faithful believers and followers of Messiah up to the end. In Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 to 9, I will read from the TLV, the Tree of Life version, from the Messianic Jewish Family Bible. Then I heard something like a voice from a great multitude, like a roar of the, of the rushing waters or like the rumbling of a powerful thunder, saying, Hallelujah! For Adonai Elohet Sabaot reigns! Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to Him! For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has already made herself ready. She has given fine linen to wear, bright and clean. For the fine linen, listen to this, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the Kedushim. What is the representation of that fine white linen? It is the righteous mitzvot, the righteous deeds of the Kedushim, the saints. Remember what Yeshua the Messiah said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16? Let your light so shine before men that they will see your mitzvot, your good deeds, how you cheerfully obey the commandments of mine, says Yeshua. Messiah Yeshua, if you love me, obey my commandments. And then he said, the people will see your good deeds, your mitzvot, the way you perform mitzvot with the right covenant, with humility. Again, with humility. Not to, not to boast that I am holier than, than him or holier than they. No. It is all by the mercies and the grace and the loving kindness of Hashem. My friends, then the angel tells me, Verse 9, write, how fortunate are those who have been invited to the wedding banquet of the Lamb. He also tells me these are the true words of God. Look at this, my friends. The marriage supper of the Lamb, where is it going to be held? In a chupa. In a sukkah. Wow. Imagine that. And the last verse I would like to share to you in this year is in Revelation of Yeshua to Yohanan John, chapter 21, verses 1 to 3. Quoting from the tree of life again. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Verse 2, I also saw the holy city. The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 3, I also heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God, the dwelling of Hashem, the dwelling of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the dwelling of Elohei Abraham, Elohei Tzkak, and Elohei Yaakov, our Father. It says, Behold, the dwelling of God is among men, and He shall tabernacle among them. Look, He will tabernacle. He will sukkah, He will make His sukkah among all the overcomers and faithful house of Israel united with Yeshua the Messiah, our Lord. They shall be his people and God himself will be among them and be their God. 
May I just greet you once again. Chag Sameach, my friends. This is something that you and I must celebrate. Even we have less food to celebrate. We have less clothing to wear on. Even at times we encounter some lacks and trials. Even at times we are encountering some, some situation beyond our control. May I just encourage you. God is calling you in His sukkah. A place where it is so simple. A place where the rich and famous will, I think, I feel, will need not even dare to hang around. They will go to Monaco. They will go to Europe. They will go to Switzerland. But to a sukkah or a simple tent? No way, Jose. That's not for me. They will drive their Maserati and Lamborghini. They will drive their Ferrari to a place where it is, wow, it is physically so glamorous for the eyes to lust upon and the flesh to pleasure on. But to us believers, true and genuine believers, lovers of God, Lovers of Yeshua and lovers of Israel. Lovers of his Shabbat and lovers of his mitzvot and his Torah. That is not for us. It's all yours. Help yourself. Mine is the word of Hashem. I will dwell in his sukkah. For there is one thing I desire. As David Amalek says, and I will dwell on. That that is I may dwell in the house of the Lord. That I may behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. Where did David Hamelech say that? In his simple good for nothing sukkah. A booth, a tent. Yeshua the Messiah chose a place where he, is, he was born. And it is not in a king's palace. It is not in the King of David Hotel even. It is not in Marriott Hotel. It is not in, in any posh hotel. It is in a sukkah. And he was placed in a feeding trough, in a crib, a wooden crib, where the cows, the donkeys feed their grass. There is where my Messiah, Yeshua, was born. And there is where it's going to be gloriously returning again. Let us be set free from, from the trappings of materialism and physicalities. If God blesses us, why not? Thank Him. But will you please be faithful in His resources be entrusted in, in you or, or through you? Can you be a very faithful steward of Hashem? Because no one can love God and at the same time money. You will love God and hate money. Or you will love money and hate God. You cannot be divided and have that kind of double standard kind of faith, false belief system, my friends. I pray that you will see and may the God of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov bless you. Chag Sameach, Shabbat Shalom. Lihitroat, my friends, and call tooth.